welcome and thank you for joining us to worship on this third Sunday in Advent. It's the Sunday of joy. Normally around this time in Advent at St. Andrews, we have the children's pageant. It's the Sunday morning when the children get to offer to the people a message about Christmas. It's almost always got an aspect of joy, but also a kind of poignancy and meaning when it comes from a child. We can't do that this year, but it doesn't mean that we can't have a message led by children. A little later in the service, Caden and Maria are gonna lead us. And with some help from Dana Lynn and her beautiful voice, and a number of other people from the congregation who you may recognize, we will receive a message. And it will have poignancy and meaning, and I do believe an aspect of joy. First, we light our Advent candles. We light a candle for joy. We light a candle for peace. And we light a candle for hope. These candles are lit for you to light your heart and your being. And they're also for the world to light its heart and its being for hope, for peace, and today for joy. I'd like to share with you one line of scripture. It's from the Gospel of John. Let it take us into worship today. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 9, we hear the true light which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. Let us pray. Holy God, gather us in, each one of us, and light our way toward hope and peace and joy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Along with our one line of scripture from the Gospel of John, the true light that enlightens everyone was coming. Along with that line, I want to offer you an ancient story. 
It's a kind of parable, so get ready because parables are kind of puzzles. There was an ancient story that speaks of the second coming of the Messiah, the second coming of the Messiah. It is said that he arrived anonymously one dull Monday morning at the gates of a great city to go about his father's business. There was much for him to do. While many years had passed since his last visit, the same suffering was present all around. Still there were the poor, the sick, the oppressed. Still there were the outcasts. And still there were the righteous who pitied them and the authorities who oppressed them. For a long time, no one took notice of this desert wanderer with his weather-beaten face and ragged, dusty clothes. This quiet man who spent his time living among the sick and the unwanted. The great city labored on like a mammoth beast, ignorant of the one who dwelt within its bowel. The story goes that the Messiah eventually decided to reveal his identity to a chosen few who had remained faithful to his teachings. These people met together in a tiny unknown church on the outskirts of the city to pray and to serve the poor. As the Messiah entered the sanctuary one Sunday morning, his eyes fell upon a tiny group huddled in a corner, each praying and weeping for the day of the Lord. As they prayed, those in the church who had gathered slowly began to feel the gaze of Christ penetrate their souls. Silence began to descend upon the circle as they realized who had entered their sacred home. For a time, no one dared to speak. Then the leader of the group gathered her courage. She approached Christ and she fell at his feet and she cried, we have waited so long for your return. For so many years, we have waited patiently for you to come. Today, as with every other day, we've prayed passionately for your arrival. And then she stood up and she looked Christ squarely in the eyes. Now that you are with us, we have but one question. Christ listened, knowing already what it would be. Tell us, Christ, when will you arrive? The Messiah did not answer, but simply smiled. Then he joined the others in their prayers and their tears, and he remains there still to this very day, waiting, watching, and serving in that tiny unknown church on the outskirts of the city. What do you make of that ancient story that I told? Christ decides to reveal himself to a group of people, a group of people who have been waiting and praying and serving for years, who've been living more faithfully to his teachings than you or I probably ever would or could. And when they have him right in front of them and they could ask him anything, they only ask him one question. When will you arrive? He's standing right there in front of them and they ask him, when will you arrive? And Christ knew that that was the question they were going to ask. What do you make of that? Parables are puzzles. There isn't one interpretation or one meaning to a parable. And so if there's something in that story that intrigues you or that you'd like to work on, you should feel very free to fast forward through this next part of what I'm going to say because what comes after me is Caden and Maria and some of the others in a video. But if you're interested in exploring this with me a little bit, I do think that this parable is asking us a few more questions that might be interesting to ask ourselves. Questions that have to do with what it means to be with someone and also long for or wait for someone. 
I'm going to ask you a series of questions and even ask you to use your imagination a little bit. But first, let's just talk about the concept of desire for a moment, specifically desiring another. We often think that desire comes out of absence. We desire or we long for or we hope for that which we do not have, right? That our want is fulfilled once we have it. But what if we've got this wrong? What if we've got this wrong, especially in terms of God and other human beings? Here's a series of questions for you. What if we can long for the arrival of someone only after they've already turned up? What if we can desire only the one who we are already in relationship with? What if the presence of the other is precisely that which makes us yearn for them? To get at what I want to with these questions, let's just use our imaginations for a moment. Imagine that you're single. Maybe you are single. If not, imagine that you are and that we are single and we want to be in relationship with someone. Not someone in particular, but relationship with someone. Maybe we want to be in relationship with someone because we're lonely or because in some way we feel incomplete without someone else. The point is that we're seeking a relationship with someone. We cannot, at this point, seek the arrival of a particular person because we don't yet know that person. We have not yet met a particular person to whom we are attracted. We desire someone, but that someone is no one in particular. This person is no more than an idea, an image perhaps that we have in our minds. Now imagine that one day we meet a person and begin to form a relationship with them. And at this point, our desire, our hope for someone is transformed into a desire for the person with whom we are developing a relationship. We no longer desire someone in the abstraction. We desire someone, a specific person. We could not have desired that person before we met them because we did not know them. When we meet someone, when we meet our beloved, we will often feel that we were always looking for that person, that we were even maybe incomplete without them. But that always that came before can only be a retroactive creation, right? Something that happens after the fact. The lover is the one whose heart says, I had no need of you until I met you, but now that I know you, I have always needed you. The point here is that our desire is not satisfied by the arrival of that someone, but rather it was born there. But not only was our desire born there, the presence of our beloved sustains our desire, our hopes to be in relationship with them. The presence of that person sustains the hope to be in relationship with them. Why? Not because they're perfect and per perfectly fulfilling for us, that's not possible. And not even because they've saved us. I don't think that's possible either. The reason the presence and not the absence sustains our desire relates to the fact that we only ever know our beloved or anyone in part, like through a glass darkly. That's all that's possible. You know, the small, fragile exterior frame of any person houses an interior world of infinite proportions. And our encounter with someone does not equal some kind of full contact with them. It never can. People we have known all our life will to some degree remain a mystery to us, just as they will remain a mystery to themselves. In fact, it's often only after a relationship develops 
that one really begins to realize the depth and the mystery that the other person's fragile frame houses. At the beginning of a relationship, we're often so intoxicated and we have a feeling that we know this person so intimately and so deeply. It can take many years to come to appreciate the impenetrable mystery that that person is and to respect it. Many years. So that means that when the one we love arrives, we experience this person simultaneously as the one who is still to come. Not despite their presence, but because of it. The presence of this person testifies to this person's forever absence, to the fact that they will always be distant from us, even when they're right here. So take all of that and think about Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. Identity revealed, but never fully. When will you arrive? You know, the incoming of God that's expressed in the incarnation, the birth of a child, that represents this beautiful expression of the simultaneous revealing and withdrawing. Because in the incarnation, the mystery of God is not dispelled, it's deepened. This fragile frame, the child, that's an exterior housing the infinite world within. I think that's partly why it's so poignant to hear or see the Christmas message shown by children themselves. Another question. Have you ever asked in the hard times of your life, where are you, God? When will you come? What will you do? How will you be? Many people are asking that right now. One question, God, when will you arrive? God can seem absent. It happens to all of us. But let's go back to the original thing that I was asking about desire and being with. We often think that desire, what we want and what we hope for, arises insofar as what we would desire is absent. But what if we've got this wrong, at least in relation to God? What if? We can long for the arrival of someone only when that person has already shown up. What if we can desire only the one that we are already in relationship with? And what if the presence of the other, the presence of the other, is precisely that which makes us yearn for them? In the story, the Messiah entered the modest sanctuary one Sunday morning, and his eyes fell upon a tiny group huddled in one corner, each praying and weeping for the day of the Lord. As they prayed, those who had gathered in the church slowly began to feel the gaze of Christ upon their souls. Silence began to descend within the circle as they realized who had entered their sacred home. And the story ends with the incarnate mystery, waiting, watching, and serving with them.
You know, no matter what, darkness and strangeness is part of this particular Advent season. Christmas will come. The Christ child will be born. Anyway, with that beautiful mystery in mind, let's turn to the prayers of the people. Prayers of the people are for our own lives, for the lives of those that we care about, and also for the wider world. Let us pray. Holy and mysterious God, in the darkness and the strangeness of this season, hear our prayers. And on this particular Sunday for joy, hear our prayer of gratitude for our lives and for that which is in it that fills us with joy. And alongside our joy, God, look into our hearts and see there our needs, that which is absent, that which we long for, that which we wait for, that which we desire. God, help each one of us to know that we are not alone in our waiting or our longing. And let this mystery of incarnation somehow be born in us to do its work in each one of us in its own way and its own time. God, look into our hearts as we lift up those who we are concerned about. We pray first for those in our lives who are so near and yet feel so far away. And we pray for those who are so far away and yet feel so near. May they know some hope, some peace, some joy. And God, we lift up to you in prayer anyone who is feeling isolated or feeling lost or feeling unwell. Anyone who is stressed or anxious or whose well has just run dry. God, we lift them all to you in these prayers of the people. And holy God, you have a power beyond our own that is both mysterious and incarnate. And so we bring to you in our prayers, the world the world that is in need of peace, the world that is in need of hope, and holy God, the world that is in need of joy. These things we pray together with Christ in the Lord's Prayer saying, Our Mother, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn may very well be a blessing for us and for the world. It's joy to the world, so let's sing it and bless one another. God bless you all. Amen. <laughs>